In 1921, the predominantly black neighborhood of Greenwood in Tulsa, Oklahoma was victim to one of the biggest massacres on U.S. soil. More than 1,000 African-American homes and businesses were looted and burned to the ground. And for decades, the massacre went untold. White businessmen who ran the city realized that Tulsa had a huge PR problem, and they were determined to bury the story. Stop killing our people! Stop killing our people! But on the heels of the reignition of the Black Lives Matter movement, there's been national attention brought to the massacre through news outlets. In 1921, a white mob burned Greenwood to ash. As well as pop culture. The story is now getting the attention it deserves. But the massacre is only half of that story. What happened after the massacre is just as important. The real story here is the story of the indomitable human spirit. It's about these remarkable black people who had vision. They created something that was of national renown. They watched it destroyed unjustly. Most of them remained. They were resilient. They rebuilt, even in the face of great hostility. In order to understand the massacre in Tulsa, you have to understand the context around it. So the national context is something that sociologists and historians often call the low point of race relations in America because it was a proliferation of, of so-called race riots. These were invasions of black communities all across the country. 1919 was dubbed Red Summer, with riots in dozens of cities around America in what was mostly white on black violence. Greenwood, however, dodged those riots and actually flourished because of the oil boom. More than 10,000 people lived there. People were coming in daily to this incredible boom town, this oil city of Tulsa. Jobs were plentiful. Plenty of people had, you know, regular steady paychecks. It was like a, a main street, really. So you would have beauty salons and barbershops, laundries, grocery stores, restaurants. So this was kind of an every man's paradise owned by black folks concentrated in a 35 square block area that abuts downtown Tulsa. During that era, a successful black community was met with white resentment, and Greenwood was no different. The idea was gain economic power, gain wealth, and then you will get respect, and with respect will come political power. Well, just the opposite happened in Tulsa. If you gain economic power, you will court resentment and violence, ultimately. White Americans can get very upset and jealous when they see African Americans who have things, cars, nice homes, that they don't have. There's no question that part of that jealousy was part of the fuel for what became the Tulsa Race Massacre, but it really wasn't the spark that began it. That spark was a black boy accidentally touching a white girl in an elevator. Tulsa was a tinderbox, a powder keg, needing only some sort of igniter or catalyst. That event involved two teenagers, Dick Rowland, 19 years old, shoeshine boy who works downtown, Sarah Page, 17 years old, white girl who operates an elevator in the downtown Drexel building. What we think happened is as Dick stepped onto the elevator, he tripped, he reached his hand out, he probably grabbed Sarah Page, she screamed, and he ran out of the elevator. Meanwhile, a clerk, a white clerk in a nearby store, had concluded that this had been an interracial rape attempt, and he started to spread that story. The next morning, Dick Rowland was arrested and taken to the courthouse, and that could have been the end of things. Had it not been for the intervention of the Tulsa Tribune, which the next day published an article entitled, Nab Negro for Attacking Girl in an Elevator. It was a false narrative that painted the portrait of an attempted rape in broad daylight in a public space in downtown Tulsa. 
After hearing rumors that Dick Rowland would be lynched, several dozen black World War I vets assembled with weapons to confront the mob. As you might imagine, words are exchanged between the larger white group and the smaller black group. White man tries to take a black man's gun, the gun discharges. Chaos ensues. The violence lasted roughly 16 hours. Black men put up a fearless defense of the Greenwood community. But ultimately the mob spills over into the Greenwood district, burning, looting, shooting, destroying everything in sight. The destruction of Greenwood wasn't just bad, it was total. It's just like a wave that goes block by block both movie theaters go up, the public library branch goes up, the African American hospital is burned, 22 churches are burned, grocery stores, restaurants, everything is leveled. In terms of the number of people who died, there are reasonable estimates that go as high as 300. And Greenwood is, you know, physically speaking, is gone. Property damage estimates range from $1.5 to $2 million, which translates to $25 million today. But this isn't where the story ends. The fact of the matter is, is that Black Tulsans rebuilt Greenwood. The community rebuilt it. And that rebuilding was an uphill battle. With no help from the federal government and the city of Tulsa actively trying to prevent the rebuilding, the Greenwood community began the long, slow reconstruction of Greenwood. The massacre in the black community became a point of pride. The fact is that they fought back. So this was a defiant community, it was a proud community, and they were determined to stay. So the community we know was rebuilt to a significant enough degree to host this national conference of these black business leaders in 1925. In other words, yes, you may kill us. Yes, you may burn us out, but we shall not be moved. We will persevere. We will go forward. Greenwood did rise again from the ashes. And by the 1930s and 1940s, you can make an argument that it was even grander than it was before. While Greenwood was able to withstand and rebuild after their neighborhood was razed to the ground, it wasn't able to withstand the second attack on the community, which was much less obvious, but no less devious. The first of those attacks, ironically, was integration. And for many of us, that's counterintuitive because we, we embrace integration as a positive value. But when integration comes along, black dollars flow outside the community. Why? Because there are more goods and services available to black folks at better price points for black folks, and it undermines the financial foundation of the community. The other factor that destroyed Greenwood for a second time, urban renewal. Urban renewal projects often have negative effects on communities of color because those communities are often unable to stand up against urban planning done by people who don't take into consideration the thoughts and values of communities of color. One of those projects? An eight lane interstate freeway was plowed right through deep Greenwood through the heart of the community there. It divided the community in such a way that it's virtually impossible for the community to, to come back together as a cohesive whole like it was before the location of the highway. And Greenwood wasn't the only city destroyed by these freeways. Chicago, Detroit, Durham, the Bronx, Los Angeles, all suffered similar devastating effects from freeways essentially ripping a hole directly through black communities during the 50s and 60s. It's the old cliche, if you're not at the table, you're on the menu. Certainly, I hope that's changing with movements like the Black Lives Matter movement and what we're seeing today. But in the past, 
a lot of these communities of color just didn't have a place at the table, didn't have a voice, and didn't have the number of white allies that I hope that we have today.